I mean, nothing lasts forever, right? So I'm going to talk about a topic that I have not talked about in almost four years at this point. So that is the idea of superhero fatigue. I have talked about this once before. If you want to see a very old video from before I was even out, before I had this hair or this kind of glasses or um, um, other things uh, about myself. Um, but at the time, I was talking about superhero fatigue generally as a genre. And my basic premise at the time was that so long as the majority of the output is not simply mediocre, then I figured the genre had a lot of legs in it because the specific tone of any superhero movie can vary greatly. Just look at how tonally different the Marvel movies are from the DC stuff and how tonally different the theatrical Justice League is from the Zack Snyder Justice League. So, like, there's plenty of room to do something unique. But my point in that video, if you don't feel like watching the whole thing, was ultimately as long as things don't hit a background level of mediocrity, because even bad stuff can't really derail a genre unless it's like almost all bad, because the bad stuff can put the good stuff into sharp relief. It's when it starts to feel cookie cutter, like everything is basically hitting the same basic level of unexceptional competence. That's where things get rough. Now... This time, I'm not going to talk about superhero fatigue in general. I want to talk specifically about the idea of Marvel fatigue. And I'm not approaching it from the same angle as I did four years ago. Shocking. I'm a different person now with different ideas. While I don't disagree with that old video, I never really indulged the notion of Marvel fatigue specifically, very seriously, until Disney Plus Day happened. And we got the full announcement of all the stuff they've got coming out. So... This, like, and this is not even going to be a complete list. I know I'm going to miss some stuff here. Disney Plus Day brought us teaser trailers for stuff we already knew was happening. So that included Moon Knight, She-Hulk, and Ms. Marvel. It included announcements uh, and logo debuts and things like that for Spider-Man Freshman Year, Agatha the House of Harkness. There's going to be a Marvel Zombies series. There's going to be another season of what if they are going to revive the 90s X-Men cartoon and they are already working on a spinoff for a character from Hawkeye, which hasn't even aired yet at the time that the announcement hit. So that's on top of all the other stuff that we know is in some degree in the works. We know there's going to be some sort of I Am Groot I think it's a holiday special. There's going to be that at some point down the line. They're working on a Wakanda series. There's a lot of stuff. And this has me worried in a way that Marvel films don't. Because the thing is, with movie releases, you're not only competing with yourself. You have to find a window in the release schedule where you are not going to go up against something that is going to eat out of your audience base on the weekends that it's out. Or at least you want to avoid that as much as possible. Obviously, multi especially during blockbuster season, movies stack up and pile up. But it's very typical for big movies in similar genres with similar feels to really try and avoid each other if they can, because they're going to cannibalize each other's audiences. So even as the number of Marvel movies coming out every year has increased, and now we're sort of looking at a world where there's going to be four, maybe even five Marvel movies a year, that is still a two to three month gap between releases. And while the movies may linger in theaters long enough that that Theoretically, you could see one movie that has been in theaters for a month, month and a half, and then a few weeks later see a brand new movie and they feel very close together. Since the big push is always for the initial debut and the premiere weekend, it doesn't feel quite as crowded. But we're starting to look down the barrel of Marvel shows on Disney Plus that are piggybacking immediately off each other. That's kind of what we actually have already dealt with to a certain amount just this year. Because we had WandaVision lead almost immediately into Loki, lead almost immediately into What If. We got a little bit of a breather between What If and Hawkeye, but honestly, 
every time one of those ended, I remember thinking, oh, okay, I can get a, what, there's another one? Ah, crap. Now, granted, my perspective is slightly skewed because I talk about this stuff for my job. So I do actually have a higher sense of obligation because I've got financial interests, um, you know, involved in, in actually seeing and talking about these things. But I don't think I've completely lost my perspective of what it's like just to be a fan and feel like, well, I want to know and I want to be involved and I want to see all this stuff, but you're not giving me a break. And I'm worried a little bit about the Disney Plus stuff in particular. Now, in some ways, the fact that most of this is all getting shoved onto Disney Plus is a good thing. Because, and I've said this for always, I said this like way back when people kept expecting the uh, the Netflix Marvel movies to, uh, not Marvel movies, Marvel TV shows to impact the movies or for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to be acknowledged in the films. And I've always said like, look, the movies get more people to see them. That has always been the case. And while the shows will be built off the movies, the movies won't be built off the shows, not in a way that absolutely requires you watch the shows. I think we will start to see increasing times where you'll feel a bit more in the know, but I will be shocked if Marvel ever starts making movies that you cannot understand unless you've been watching the shows, because the audiences are not as big. They're just not. So you're limiting your audience size. So by doing the big deluge of stuff in the... Uh, space of Disney Plus, effectively in television, for all intents and purposes, that does keep it from basically sort of uh, trampling on the movies. Uh, Again, unless they get dumb and start making, uh, watching the show's essential viewing to understanding the movies. So, like, my my primary example for how I expect this to play out, we are going to get another Captain America movie. It is going to have Sam as Captain America. It is going to be built off of the show Captain America and the Winter Falcon. Um, What? Captain America? (laughs) The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. (laughs) I think it just came up with like a fanfic parody or something. Ah, the new Captain America will be built on the back of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier TV show. However, I have no doubt in my mind that the way it's going to be presented is a way that will still flow off of the end of Endgame. So that if you watch it following the end of Endgame and that ending had Bucky and Sam kind of together and Sam accepting the shield, you watch the next Captain America where he is Captain America and you go, okay, in the interim between these movies, he came to terms with wielding that shield. Cool. If you have watched the show, you saw that play out, but it's a general trajectory that makes sense even if you didn't watch the show. That is the way in which I expect these to relate to the movies. So the movies aren't necessarily going to be the issue, but even when separating them and putting it on Disney Plus and putting it in an environment that it you don't have to worry about bumping against about uh, up against other stuff as much because it's all going up on entirely your own platform this still feels like a lot and i don't i think part of what's throwing me off at least is that right now disney's major brands have all moved to disney plus like Pixar's doing multiple TV shows. They've had movies actually debut on Disney+. Plus. The Star Wars stuff, now that they don't have much going on with the movies, I guess Rogue Squadron's still happening, but Star Wars is largely relegated to Disney+. Plus. Marvel, yeah, still has movies, but all this new stuff's here, and like I don't even know what's airing on the actual Disney Channel, like on television proper anymore, or Disney XD. It's, that seems to be where actual original stuff goes, like your Owl Houses, Amphibia, etc. But they seem to have put all the big branded stuff on Disney+, Plus, which from a business perspective does make sense because that's going to push the, um, the growth. They wanted to launch it as strongly as possible and, you know, leveraging your strongest brands to not do that would be stupid. So I get that. But at this point, it's just so much. And I think 
there is a danger, I think, of Marvel oversaturation on Disney Plus specifically. Again, I expect things to be separate enough that for the most part, it won't impact the movies, but there may still be some knock-on effects because if the really dedicated fans, the ones who tune into Disney Plus and watch everything, like me, and I would have done even if it wasn't my living at this point, are we going to be exhausted of Marvel stuff by the time the next movie comes out and maybe not rush out to see it opening weekend? Maybe wait for it to hit streaming. Maybe just decide, eh, I don't need to see it right away. I don't know. Maybe we will, but this is not a fear that I would have had or a notion I would have indulged at all, you know, even four months ago. But now it is starting to feel more like homework. Again, that's partially my perspective, having to watch it. Um, I, like, I suspect left 100% of my own devices and without, um, reviews and thoughts on it being expected of me by my audience, I might give, like, say, a second season of What If a pass. I'd probably give Marvel Zombies a pass. I'm not going to say it's impossible for me to bail on these things if I really don't like them, but I feel obligated to at least give them a shot. So maybe that perspective is skewing things because... I don't know to what degree people who don't talk about this stuff for a living feel an actual obligation. I'm sure there is to some degree some kind of fan obligations that they certainly want you to feel. They want you to feel like you have to watch everything. But eventually, I think most people will hit a point where they're going to go, no, but I don't actually need to watch all of this. And I think we'll start to see, I think, what well, what I hope, because I, I like Marvel. I like the MCU. I like the Marvel products. I've I loved most of the movies. I've enjoyed to varying degrees most of the TV products, some more than others. But that does not mean I want them to just go on in perpetuity and dominate absolutely everything nonstop because I do need other things in my life. And when you start filling the world with so much Marvel stuff that it feels like I don't have time for anything else. And again, from a business perspective, I actually understand Disney wants you to stay on their platform. It doesn't want you on other people's platforms. But like at a certain point, it starts to feel coercive and not like a healthy fan relationship. And I think think, or what I hope we will see is that interest in certain parts of this will start to dwindle. If I'm being honest, it'll probably be the animated stuff, which won't be entirely fair, but is, I would say it's likely. Like, there's a reason that What If was animated the way that it was, because the method of animation they chose is a heck of a lot faster and cheaper than either fully properly rendered 3D uh, animation or 2D hand drawn. They rode the middle ground in the pocket of it being faster and cheaper. So I think they already know this. And so I, what I kind of suspect is that give it a year, two years, and we'll start to see a drop off because, like, maybe fans uh, will watch a whole bunch of first and second episodes and then realize, eh, I've got other things to do. And then there'll be drop-offs and whatever those shows are, we'll see less of what, we'll see less of them going forward. And if I were to pick what is likely to be the, be dinged, I think it's going to be A, the animated stuff, like I said, and B, things like Echo and like House of Agatha, the spinoffs of the shows that we already got. Because like these things had a strong launch out of the gate because they were bringing in the movie characters. And while uh, it makes for a theoretically stronger ongoing um, pool of resources and characters to work from, to not have to pull in the movie actors for everything, when you start doing the spin-offs of the thing that you already had to kind of sell us on by bringing in the bigger names, and now you're giving us the spin-off without those bigger names, I'm not going to say it can't work, but if something's going to taper off, I think it's going to be those. And then if I were to take my most possible pessimistic view, the long-term most pessimistic, pessimistic option that I would have would be that eventually they start to realize that the only thing that is doing well enough for it to be worth it for them are the ones that involve the movie actors and characters, but that they can't afford to keep putting them on TV because, you know, people like Paul Bettany and Elizabeth 
Olson and Anthony Mackey and Sebastian Stan, they command higher prices than the stars that they've got lined up for same Ms. Marvel. So I don't think they'll ever stop producing Marvel stuff for Disney+. Plus. That won't happen. But I will not be surprised if after a year, two years, it tapers off after this initial explosion. This feels like throwing everything at the wall to see, not, not throwing it all at the wall to see what sticks in a we don't know what works way, but more of a, you know what, we've got their attention, throw everything and let's figure out what's worth keeping. So normally when you say throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, it's an implication that people have no idea what they're doing. I think they know what they're doing. And I would not be surprised if an eventual rolling back and tapering back of the extent of all this is actually part of the plan. But we'll see, because it does feel like a lot right now. And this is the first time I've indulged the idea of Marvel fatigue in anything other than a thought exercise, that I thought it might actually happen. That's kind of where I'm at with this. What do you think? Are you already fatigued? I've heard from some people who are. Do you think you will be? Do you think you can't be? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Like, share, subscribe. I have a Patreon. It's how I'm able to afford things like Disney Plus and do this as my living. Any amount you're able to help is of great assistance and appreciated. But don't worry too much. At the end of the day, you are the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Hey, if you're sticking around through the credits, might as well hear some names read out. My Patreon helps support this, and in particular, I want to thank Raven McBain, Bookworm, MJ, Tracy Scrabbit, Vincent Paul Bartolucci, Kaylin Schwartz, Edelin, Robin Moore, Ross Schultz, Shayla Gourlay. Want to hear me mispronounce your name? Check out the rewards on the Patreon. <laughs>